You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call. I've got Brad Hunt here beside me. Today's podcast is the Q and A panel discussion at the end of the Western Hunting Summit. There was we had we held two summits with Stealthy Hunter. The first one we already published. This is the second summit. Same uh, format. Uh, Just a little different group of people. Yeah, slightly different group of guests. Joel Turner uh, returns. Yep. There's a few others. And the audience asks us a lot of questions that were on the panel. And uh, we just kind of rifled through them. It was a, it was a, it was a great discussion. You're going to enjoy it. I think that event just seems to every year get more and more uh, meaningful, more mm-hmm. special, more, more is taken in and learned. It's a community now. It's not just an event. Right. It seems that um, so many people that have gone always return to the summit. If they've gone once, they've gone twice. If they've gone twice, they've gone three times. Mm-hmm. It's like every year it's a goal to attend. You get to hang out with like-minded people. There's 40, 50 people there that share your values. Yep. You go shoot archery for two days, mm-hmm. and it's like going to the Total Archery Challenge in the way yeah. that the... <laughs> They're no joke. Ryan puts together these he courses puts that are tough. A sweet 3D course together, steep downhill, steep uphills, they're through fun. brush. They're, 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 they're no joke. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's realistic, yes. like a real hunting scenario can play out. You're there to be instructed by people uh, at like Joel Turner. Uh, I think Joel, um, you know, from Shot IQ and the Turner Method, mm-hmm. is a phenomenal um, teacher of how to stay calm and 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 how to execute a controlled shot Absolutely. in a high stress situation. And he's right there to give you one on one coaching. I think that if you were to attend a, something like that, it's a it's a very expensive event yeah. to be part of. And it's 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 amazing to see those people that get to do that one-on-one interaction with Joel, mm-hmm. how much it changes them. And then when you see them a day later and what they're shooting, or if some of the people we've seen Absolutely. from a year later, it's yeah. incredible. It's life-changing. Mm-hmm. Joe Rogan had Joel on his podcast not too long ago. Yeah. And he has made a profound impact on Rogan's uh, shooting and... Uh, it was a very cool discussion yeah. to see, and Joel nailed it. If you haven't heard that podcast, you should go check it out. It was very good. Yep. You get to meet guys like Sam Davis, uh, who is just, a, uh, well, I guess he's in his mid-30s now, yeah, late he's, 30s. he's late 30s, and he's just high energy. But He won know. the archery shootout, uh, the, the the 3D course. Yes. Him and Brian Barney are both there as both there. They're they're amazing mm-hmm. individuals to follow, but archery hunting fanatics, and uh, they have they they they're your blue collar guys that get it done year over year, and they have just a wealth of information to share. You've got Jason Phelps, Cody. Yeah, on this one you got Wilson, Mark Livesey, Mark Livesey, mm-hmm. Doctor Corey, which backcountry medical like changes people's lives because. You know, even myself, I didn't have that backcountry medical experience. Didn't have a very good first aid kit. He's got this totally year, changed. They butchered a buffalo. <laughs> yeah, we did a live they, buffalo. They shot a buffalo that Ty Stubblefield brought mm-hmm. along, and uh, we broke it down. <laughs> and broke basically, it down, we taught him how it. to how we would do it, bone out in the backcountry, mm-hmm. the gutless method. We went through all of that. It it's just an incredible uh, event. Uh, if you're if you're if you're this and and it it it. it it works for super experienced people as well as absolute beginners never yes. done this before. Yep. It it really can uh, – because it's not just I, – I focused on the bow, but there's a whole rifle uh, course as well. Correct. And you have guys like Brady Miller out there smoking targets at a mile. <laughs> I know. And you're going on a course as well with rifles touring and shooting and, yep. and learning from some of the best. And some of those guys that were there – Incredible shooters. Incredible shooters. And they're the guests. Yeah. So again, um, it's an excellent event. And right now, if you're if you're interested in going right now, you could win a chance to go just by shopping at Stealthy Hunter. 
Right now, it is open for enrollment. You can go to the westernhuntingsummit.com or westernhuntingsummit.com, and we'll put the link in the description field of this video. But if you go there, you can sign up now for next year, which if you're interested in going, I recommend it. Sign up, put in your deposit, get in. If you do win, uh, Lampers and Hillary, Ryan and, and Hillary will reimburse you mm -hmm. for that. But not only can you win an entry if you shop at Stealthy right now using the code Gritty, you can also win a huge prize package yeah. that is worth probably three or four thousand dollars. Yeah, a little over four thousand dollars. Over four thousand. Stuff like all the gear from Peaks, all the stuff from Stealthy. You get um, an initial ascent eight K pack that's brand new to the market. Uh, and then you get the Wild Society food mills, which are not cheap. They're great mills. Like we've been. You should liking. check out Wild Society uh, yes. freeze dried meals if you haven't. They're good uh, for your next hunt. They're an excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah. They they're making excellent meals. They're giving ten breakfasts and ten dinners away in yeah. that package. It's a it's a great chance. So if you listen to this podcast and you're inspired to go, uh, go check it out. Sign up right away. Don't wait. I think it fills up pretty quick. It already has filled up. We announced yeah. it just a few days ago, <laughs> and uh, I think they're one third of the way gone in just two days, even over the holiday. Yep. So if you really want to go, do it. I, I can't recommend it enough. There's not a lot of things where I would say, just do it. You'll never regret it. Um, yeah. You know, especially when I'm encouraging someone to spend their money. Right. But I honestly feel like uh, if hunting's your thing, you need community. You want to you want to uh, learn from the best, get better at what you do. There's not an event that's more personable and more meaningful that I've been to in quite a long time yep. than this is. And that's the thing is you're not just getting hunting information. I mean, the personal connections and the just in depth that we get into in the podcast and you know our families and how we do things and how the guests do things as well. I mean, they touch us just as much as we touch them. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. Pretty incredible community. So, you know, not everybody has the budget to pull it off. So you can win, just go shop at Stealthy. It, every, I think $10 is an entry. Yep. Hope you enjoy the show today. Like I said, if you shop at Peaks or Stealthy right now, you can win something. If you need gear, um, go ahead and do that. And, mm -hmm. You're entered to win. It'll be fun. Thank you for always supporting our work and what we do. We truly appreciate it. We couldn't do this and and bring this stuff to you if you weren't there to support us. So thank you so much and uh, stay gritty. Welcome back to the Hunt Harvest Health Podcast. This is Dr. Hillary Lampers, and I am here with all these guys um, at the Western Hunting Summit combo event. Uh, this is our second event for this year. And we are doing the Q&A. Um, I'm just going to let everybody introduce themselves really quick. So maybe we will start on this end. Hmm. I am Brad Hunt. I am a co-host on the Gritty Podcast, Gritty Films, and the secretary for Brian Call. <laughs> All right, Ryan Lampers, um, the guy that doesn't talk as much as the rest of the guys on this panel. Stealthy Hunter. Yep, Stealthy Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, and I'm Ryan's wife, who does all the talking, uh, Dr. Hillary Lamper, Stealthy Hunter, Get Stealthy Events, and uh, we are the co-founders of this, well, we're the founders of this event, but we could not do any of this event without every single person on this panel, so this is really everybody's event. All right, um, Sam Davis, um, bow hunter. Uh, love, love to bow hunt, live to bow hunt. And, uh, yeah, that's me out of Wyoming. I'm Brian Barney, uh, bow hunter as well. Eastman's Elevated is the podcast and, um, yeah, happy to be here with you guys. I'm Brady Miller. I'm the guy that's absolutely addicted to mule deer hunting, mule deer hunting only. We're for Go Hunt. I'm the head of editorial over there. All things written. Brian Call, I do the Gritty Podcast, Gritty Films, Like Hunting conservation joel turner with shot iq shot iq.com and the turner method mark let say tree light academy tree light pursuits and i'm really the slave behind this event <laughs> um <laughs> i'm uh ryan's a little minion he bosses around before you guys all get here dr Corey tingle said i'm the uh, backcountry medical and remote expedition medical educator 
All right. So this is your chance to ask questions. Uh, don't be shy. We've answered lots of different types of questions. So if you guys and gals have any questions that you want to ask, please, this is the time to do it. All right. Well, I'll start. <clears throat> um, Say how, your name. If oh, you- I'm Josh from Minnesota. I've been following just about every one of you guys. I just met Sam this week and I just met Corey this week. Otherwise, I'm pretty familiar with everybody. Um, just curious how you guys got started on the summit. What what um, sparked that idea and how did that get rolling? And then how have you, you know, it's evolved, obviously. It's changing locations. How do you go about that? You know, how do you make these connections? Oh, how did we start this, babe? Um, Ryan's got to talk. I guess, I guess I'll... I'll go with kind of where the idea came from. And I've said this before, probably on podcast, but we, uh, so Hill and I got to be a part of this really cool event back in the day. I don't remember how many years ago, um, probably 2016, I think it was. Years ago, yeah. And it's called Train to Hunt. Some of you have probably heard of Train to Hunt. A guy named Kenton Claremont started it. And it was a place where hunters could go do Spartan race type events. Um, shooting, running, exercise, all the things, like really hard things where uh, in the end, after the the two, three-day event, depending on what it was, everybody had a ton of respect for everybody else. Uh, and, you know, you hear the shared suffering was the phrase back then, and it's cliche, but it's very true. We, we realized that uh, anybody who had taken part of that event, they all kind of were connected in a way. And we stayed in contact with each other and we had this really cool community. And so Hill and I, you know, over the years, we thought, man, that'd be cool. We actually held our own train to hunt event out on some property in Washington state when we lived there. And uh, we met so many good folks through that, that we are still in contact with, that we kind of wanted to take on something like that and do it ourselves. And that's kind of what spawned the Western hunting summit. Yeah, and I I would just second that with uh, Ryan, I think, and he said this on many podcasts and stuff, is that mentorship has kind of become more important as we get older. You know, you can do a lot of things and have a lot of experience, but as you get to a certain age, it's like if you don't share it, it's just going to die with you. So I think that Ryan felt really called to help other people that maybe hadn't had as much mentorship in their life. And I, I think that one of the most valuable things we've gotten out of this is meeting um, people of all ages, really, that just didn't know where to start. And they didn't know how to do even the most simple things. And they didn't feel like they had a community. I do feel like that's one of the biggest things that people will say to us that come to this is that they like coming because they feel like all of a sudden they have a community of like minded people. Because maybe they live somewhere where they don't have that. They don't feel that. They don't have neighbors that like to do the same thing, that kind of stuff. So that's been beneficial. Um, The evolution of the ranches is really uh, the first two we did just in Bozeman and, you know, did daily hikes and stuff. Um, And then we got the biggest response when we would ask people what they what they wanted more of and everybody responded that they wanted to spend more time together and they wanted to have meals together. And so the first one that we did in 2021 was in the crazies and that was our first all inclusive. And that's where everybody camped. It was just like this. Um, And every year we get an awesome ranch and we think, okay, we're going to have it here every year. And every year the landowner either changes their mind or we change our mind. And we do have a very large return rate. And we've noticed that we like having it at a different ranch because it gives you guys something different to do. Because if we (laughs) had it at this, if we had it here every year, which this is a great ranch and there's tons to explore, as you see when you went out there in the breaks. But um, it just offers some different terrain uh, and different animals and that kind of stuff. So I think that's been the evolution of it. Also, you know, we, like I said when in the introduction, is that there's people, core people here that, you know, this is our business per se, but I mean, you got to find a really good group of people that are willing to help and to take weeks out of a month. You know, last month we were, last year it was almost a month. This year we're only doing two, so it's like two weeks. But by the time the guys come set out these courses and they get that first week ready, they were here a week. 
So, and then it's weeks of preparation before that. So, I mean, these guys, especially Mark um, and I'm Amy, kind of just Mark, don't just Mark, him. just Mark. <laughs> don't give him credit, Hill. You know what he does. <laughs> kind of a one man show. <laughs> no, but like, if if you if you want to put something on like this, and we we really got lucky falling into Mark because Mark's had an event business. Him and Amy have had an event business for years, and I mean, it's kind of funny. And tell me if I'm talking too much. You can shut me up, guys. Sorry. But uh, the first one we ever did at the Crazies was our first all-inclusive. And I don't run an event business. I was just like, I'll just go to Costco and buy a bunch of food and feed everybody. And we had that first weekend, and Amy was, like, helping. She just got corralled to come and help. We didn't even (laughs) at that time. She was just like, you want me to help? Like, the women come. They're always like, can I do something? Can I help? And sure, you want to help? And by the end of the weekend, Amy was like, you need serious help. (laughs) Like, You don't even know how much food you're feeding people. We're worrying, are we going to run out? And that event was like this event. We were out in the middle of the crazies. I mean, it was a two and a half hour drive to go get decent food. So she sat me down the day after, like this afternoon, and she wrote out how many people, how many pounds of meat each guy eats, how much. And she gave (laughs) these guys a shopping list, and they went to Costco for the next two weeks. And she literally saved our life because she knew how to do that. And then Mark just knows, you know, he's a businessman with events, so he knows how to run this, you know, like tents and just all these things. Ryan and I just had this idea, but there's so many little things that go into doing this and then making sure you guys are all taken care of. I mean, down to the toilets, down to the toilet paper, down to the like, you know, the signs on the road. I mean, there's so much. So we could not do this without a really solid group of friends. And that is probably for us <laughs> the most important piece of it. And um, yeah, so okay. did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I'm Chris from Washington. My question is, you guys talk a lot about the mental game when it comes to hunting. Um, it's something that I've struggled with doing, trying to do some solo stuff. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with my physical fitness. But what did you guys do to build your mental toughness and how much um, – of your physical fitness you think attributes to that mental toughness? It's a great question. Yeah. Mark, you're an expert on uh, mental toughness because you're old and fat and you still do all the things we do. (laughs) You know, I I, I don't even know where to start with that. (laughs) But I will tell a quick story. When Brian and Ryan first asked me, I'm not going to get all the details of it, when they first asked me to go on a hunt with them, right? I mean, what an honor, right, to go. We've been friends for a little while, but they never even even considered that I would go on a hunt. It was really came down that I owned llamas is what it was. Ryan's getting old. Brian's getting old. <laughs> they needed some llamas, so here comes Mark. But for me, I knew that was going to be rough. I knew what I was getting into. So that first year, I did the 75 hard to get ready for that hunt. But even with that, I was never, I knew that I was not going to be, but guys, you just got to put yourself in the position. So I decided I'm just going to put myself in the position and whatever it took, I'm just going to do it. So my biggest advice to you guys is if you're going to choose your hunt partner, choose someone that's more badass than you are because you always rise to the person that's next to you. If you're with a person that's lesser than you, you're going to lower yourself to them, not to be derogatory, but pick a partner that's going to take you to the next level, not that's one that's going to hold you to a lower level. You know, I talk about this when limitations in my course about group dynamics, like you're only as strong as your weakest link, right? Everybody knows that, right? So when you plan your hunts, it's got to be around the weak link. So really, you need to be the weak link. If you want to be the best you can be, you need to start out as the weak link. When I did triathlons, I was a, I'm not say great, but really good cyclist. Phil and I were talking about it. My first five Ironmans were terrible because all I did was bike, 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 bike. Because I love biking. I'm good at biking. But once I said, quit biking, start running, start swimming, I dropped, we were talking about times, I dropped two hours off my Ironman time by biking half of what I was biking. Because I started running more. I started doing the thing. So pick your partners that push you. Don't pick pick some that hold you back or at least equal, right? And uh, so anyway, with these guys, it's moved me to a new level. I hate to give them credit, but, but I'm working out harder. When I'm solo, 
it's a special mindset solo, right? Once you have the talent to push, then you can do it. But if you don't, solo guy, I talked to a man. I'm so mad that I left early. I'm so mad that I went home two days early. It it can be a real hunt killer solo unless you got got it. I um, got it up here first, so I know it's a little long winded, but pick your partners that push you. Joel, you deal with a lot of mental uh, control. What do you think? So. The mental game equation is knowing when, where, and how to direct your conscious mind into a specific task at a specific moment, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it, it happens with diet. It happens with physical fitness. There's a mental game to everything that we do. There's a moment of truth in everything that we do. Practice making decisions that cause your body impact. Hard things like a cold plunge every day for three and a half to five minutes, right? Stay in there till the pain sets in. Just whatever you can do, work out hard, your diet, it's all a mental game. So understanding how to put your mind in those places. And then when you get out in the woods, it's pretty easy because you don't have to take a cold plunge every day, right? But uh, that's what I do as far as just practice making decisions. And the hardest decision that you can make is controlling a movement that causes your body impact. Shooting is the highest level of concentration that there is, precision shooting. So you gain control of that first, and then gaining control of these other things in your life becomes much easier, believe it or not. Years ago, I was listening to a podcast where Jocko Willink was on there, and he said he read this article by these scientists that said self-control and discipline is finite, and once you run out of it... uh, the wheels fall off and you're just a victim of what you are. And then he he read that and then he said, I'm here to tell you that all of that is complete garbage and it's a lie. Discipline begets discipline. The more you pick something like, okay, I'm just going to make my bed every morning. Okay, now I'm going to do this. You pick easy, pretty easy things, I think, in the beginning that you know you can't fail at and you execute and you add more to that and more to that. The cold plunge, my brother did the Wim Hof thing for, I don't know, a year. And he'd go and he'd get in this cold pond. And it's that's a mental game every time you had to get in there. Like every day, every time you got in, it sucked. And did it get easier? Yeah, because over time you start to develop that mental toughness. So I always think, you know, your 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 toughness comes from picking little things that are a little bit difficult, mastering those and adding something else to it. If it's getting up at a certain time, making your bed without fail, like little things. And from there, you can you can build up from that. Physical fitness, you ask, how much does my physical fitness uh, impact my mental toughness? I don't know. I think they're kind of like woven together, you know? Um, you can be, certainly I think mental toughness is... Uh, can transcend your physical capability, your physical fitness for sure. We've seen it like Mark does it. Uh, but, but you know, certainly the fitter you are, the, 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 the more likely you, you, you are to have that mental toughness too. So I don't know. I, I just think, uh, discipline begets discipline. You build on top of, of, uh, on top of it each time, pick easy wins. You can't fail at first. Like, Maybe it's every day I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm just going to show up to CrossFit gym. Or maybe that's not your thing. It's like every day I'm going to do five squats on the rack, no matter what. You just pick that thing and you just do it. And then you pick something else and something else and something else until you have some toughness that you didn't know you had before. Going down the line. Nice. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things you guys hear me talk a lot about that, the mental game in hunting, I do think it's, it's, it's everything to me. Like literally I think a lot of people just kind of give up, but you know, I, I'm a person who's comfortable in the backcountry a lot. And I think it kind of stems from just like taking those slow moments, going out there for a day and just trying to go climb up a mountain, try to survive that night. Like that'll build a lot of mental toughness next time, do it two days, maybe go a little bit further do something different and difficult all the time to put yourself in a good position. Uh, I think it's like Michael Jordan said this quote, but like I've failed over and over again in life. And that's why you succeed. Like those moments when you feel like you're, you're failing on, on a, on a mountain hike and you just want to quit. 
you push through that. Don't, don't want to, you know, you might think you're stopping and not going to the top, but next time you're going to go to the top, you're going to start succeeding more and more, getting more comfortable being uncomfortable. And then you'll be able to put yourself in those situations where you're just like, I know how to do this. All those times I kept going out there, going further, going further, getting into some grizzly country, being comfortable doing that. I think that just builds your mental game to the point where you know everything you do out there, like you'll be able to succeed and survive and also still pursue an animal at the same time to give you more and more confidence. Yeah, I think, um, well, you guys heard when I talked like, uh, uh, mental toughness, it all starts and begin. it starts and ends with your mind. Like it's so important to wrap your mind around it, but mental toughness is slippery. It's like really tough to obtain. Uh, so it's doing difficult things and I, you're building momentum, you're building habits, whether they're good or whether they're bad all the time, every day you're building habits. So it's a matter of these long-term goals, meaning enough to you that your short-term decisions reflect your end goal. So it's like every day you're faced with what to eat for lunch. You know, do I stop at a drive through or do I prep my lunch and bring it with me. That's one of those decisions that affects your long-term goal. Uh, as you start to build this momentum, as you start to get comfortable with the uncomfortable or put yourself in these difficult decisions and make it through, you add layers of this mental toughness on. Getting your workout every day is discipline to make yourself do it. Making yourself do it is tough. Like There's been times where I've sat in my truck before I lace up my shoes and I put off going in a, a, a run in the rain because it looks uncomfortable. It doesn't seem like fun. But in the end, I lace up my shoes and I go for it. And the longer I do that, the easier I get now that I know I'm getting out of my truck. I know I'm going for a run. So why put off the inevitable? Let's just get out now and lace them up and go for it. And so you start to build this discipline. You start to build this momentum, start to build these good habits in this positive direction. And then you just keep with it. So I think like I realized early on how important it was to me. And like, I loved how Brian said it's interwoven with your mental toughness is your physical fitness. Like knowing, uh, that, that my body's capable of getting a buck out of the backcountry or that I'm capable of doing these miles. Like, um, I have confidence in myself and in my body. And, and, and as you start to do these difficult things, uh, you start to realize like what you're really capable of and then start to, uh, push the threshold even further, you know? And so, um, I also find that when I'm in good shape, I'm not as worn down at the end of the day. Like when I get a good night's sleep, I recover and feel like a brand new human in the morning. So my recovery time's less. And I also notice that I have a better positive mental outlook on everything I'm doing. Uh, so if I'm if I'm not finding deer, you know, I'm sitting there theorizing of where I am going to find deer. I'm not thinking about giving up or going home. And so always having this positive outlook on everything that's happening and the challenges and just picking my Myself up and getting back after it. And, uh, you know, I've quit early before and the regret of quitting early is far more to live that for the entire year than to grind out two more days. So I've just learned those hard lessons. Uh, and through that, I've developed my mental toughness, physical fitness, and it's the reason why I arrow every animal I arrow. For me, I would say you're hearing it right here. There's a lot of just boils down to like consistency, consistency in life. Um, for me, it's get up every single morning and I'm going to go to the gym. Then like Barney said, you strap up your shoes and you're watching it rain outside and you don't want to, and nobody knows if you do it. Nobody knows if I go to the gym or not. Like, so I'm, it's, it's all accountable on me. And that's the same thing in the back country. I could tell someone I hiked 10 miles. I might've done a mile camped out. I could have camped at my truck. Like it's, it's on you. Everything's because you asked about solo hunting, being in shape and the mental game. Yeah, it's it, yeah. So, so the consistency for me is just every single day I'm gonna get up at four o'clock in the morning. I'm gonna get my workout, and I want to every day. I mean, it, it takes it takes a little motivation to get there. Some days, some days you love it, but there's not a better feeling than I'm at six o'clock and I'm done. That's that's like boom. There's a win. Like it's a huge win. And uh, so for me, it just builds and it builds and it builds. And from that, when that consistency is rolling, then it becomes you become dedication because when you start seeing the results. When you start seeing you get cut, I mean, like, I just think of it in a workout sense for me. When you start seeing the results from a gym, because you're sore. If someone, like, hasn't worked out, I don't like when people say, I didn't get in shape for hunting season. It's like, well, don't get out of shape. You came out of September probably in pretty good shape. Roll with it now. You got momentum. Now you you got a six-pack. Your legs are jacked. Like, keep it rolling. And that's the thing is, like, don't get out of shape. Like, age, everybody says, age, my metabolism slowing down, all this. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. 
I watch 70 year old ranchers that work hard every single day. All they've done is eat eggs, bacon, potatoes their whole life, but they work every single day from daylight to dark and they're doing it till they're 80, 85 years old and they don't know any different. They just worked hard, stayed consistent their whole life. They had to work. Nothing comes easy and consistency is the key. And I think if you can take that, that's what I do. I don't have any platforms or anything. I just, I love to hunt and I know the one way to kill is you got to be consistent. And there's times where I got a little girl at home. I got a wife at home. There's a lot of times you're sitting on the ridge. You're like, damn, like it could be real nice sitting on the couch right now. It'd be real nice to be home with them. I know what they're doing. They're eating dinner. My wife's drinking coffee this morning, you know, watching the news. Like that sounds real comfortable. That's not how you kill bucks. December rolls around, it's snowing outside, and you cut it early in September, you're going to be real mad at yourself that you walked out of there. So I know you've heard all of this before, but for me, it's just consistency creates dedication. And once you see those results, that's when dedication starts. People always say, I'm going to dedicate myself to doing something. It's got to start somewhere first. You got to build that. When you start seeing those results, then you create consistency on top of it. I'm just going to make a quick note because my profession and uh, Dr. Corey can probably back me up on this, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of people wait to make changes in their life until they get some sort of horrible news, uh, whether it's a diagnosis or whatnot, um, or you can't do anything, right? Like you got diabetes now and you're going to lose your foot or something, right? And at that point, it's a little too late. Maybe to get your foot back, you can still make changes, But I think our human nature and the way our brain works is that sometimes we get really caught up in what we don't have and what we're not doing and the negativity of that. And I see it in a lot of patients and the self-talk that you don't actually have any power over this, like everything has power over you. Um, And that's a very, very common uh, narrative. And I think we've all been through that at times in our life. Like we feel like there's nothing that, you know, everything is against us. And in some cases it may be because we all come from different places and we all have different educations about things. But the truth is, is that it's pretty uh, miraculous that when you wake up in the morning, your eyes open. And you have the choice to do something. And it's very cliche, as Ryan always says. But when you're in the medical profession, you see it. And the truth is, like, I can't tell a patient to do anything. I'm a facilitator. If you can't make the mental change to do it, if you don't feel that you're valuable enough to make those changes, or maybe you don't, you know, other people say, well, I don't have anybody in my life that makes me feel good. Nobody's cheering me on that doesn't, that's, what does anybody else do for you? You know, like they can cheer you on, but you still have to have the mental fortitude to do it. And a lot of our culture is being driven by this negative narrative that you don't have any control over your life and you should just give in to the powers that be. And the truth is you have all the power. And I think that's the mental game is accepting that you actually have so many choices that you can make to positively positively affect your life, whether that's killing big buck or losing weight or um, having that mental fortitude, you know, I mean, life is just hard in a lot of ways and you can't get around it. And life is also now very simple, which I think makes people lazy. So I don't know, Corey, if you. Yeah, I just, I would say don't outsource your well-being. I mean, you've, your mind's an incredible thing and there's nobody that I've met here that, that can't go out and solo hunt. And if, but you got to believe you can do it, you know, and what I've tried to teach is, you know, don't rely on, an, on this hospital and an emergency department to tell you whether or not you can continue your hunt. You know, there's some basic things that you can do to assess your situation. And I think that's empowering. I mean, all these things that you've learned the past few days give you one more tool in your toolbox. And I think the more tools you have, the more confident you start to feel and then you can start to say, hey, my mind can use all these tools and, and I can rely on myself. I, you know, being self-reliant, there's no place better to hone those skills than, than being out by yourself. I, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I was fortunate to meet your daughter last year and your daughter this year. Two, two daughters, Izzy and, and Ellie. Ellie went out on this whole hike with us, comes back and then had to add like smash a whole bunch more miles afterward and run like, you know, all these miles. Now, what is it that got your daughters this way that they, 
that they put in work and they have that discipline and they, that's a mental grind. That's mental toughness combined with their fist fitness. What is it? You know, when, when Kim and I met, we, we were doing, we were living in Minnesota at the time. So our wilderness was the boundary waters and we met in college and we started canoe camping and going further and further into the boundary waters canoe area and stuff like that and getting you know longer and longer trips. And when it came time to decide to have a family, we didn't want any of that to change because we'd seen so many of our friends say, okay, well, we're going to hit pause on what mm. we do as a couple and who we are as a couple. We're going to just put that on hold for a little bit, raise these kids up. And we're like, that didn't seem right to us. So Isabel went in a front pack at two months old and we did our first wilderness backpacking trip. And I remember we were breaking through these snow bridges and I was stopping on my backpack <laughs> and on her without, you know, falling through these snow bridges. And people would say, well, really, is that really good parenting? I don't know. I mean, you'd have to know my daughters. I'm, I'm impressed. Because, so what we, I guess what I'm getting at is we had our, we had what defined us as a couple and as a team. And we didn't want anything to change that. And we wanted the girls to be doing those things with us as they became adults. And we just figured, well, we're just going to keep living our life. This is what our model is. And I think they just learned that that was it. That was what their life was going to look like. Because we've never, I mean, I've never said, hey, we're going hunting now. Are you ready? It's like, dad, I got my stuff ready. What are you, what are you slowing down for? I mean, come on. So they, so, they were doing hard things from day one. I mean, they one. did hard things. I mean, I, I remember lots of, uh, lots of hikes, you know, in and out of the backpack, you know, when they could start to walk. You know, I had, then I switched to the, the kid frame backpack and I had them done there and, and pretty soon, you know, they're walking a half mile and then they're back in the backpack and, and then, uh, they're running ahead with the dog and they're coming back and it, it was just, it was just what we did. And I don't, I don't know if that was just, I mean, we didn't try to do it. It just happened. And I think some of it's what you're, I mean, you obviously start with a foundation. So, I mean, I can't discount the fact that they were just born with determination, but I think then our job is to just kind of encourage each other. Um, and kind of garden that that soil that that you've been given, and I think that's what we can all do at these summits. Is that kind of like what Hillary said? Our world is trying to pick us off one by one, right? Because we're we're kind of this weird minority of people who want to be self sufficient and do these hard things. So when we're out there doing our thing, we start to doubt ourselves. Like, well, I don't know if I should do that thing solo, right? But we get in a group like this and we've got people that are like-minded and we can draw that, that encouragement from each other. And I think that's really important to use these meetings to affirm what you feel is right for you and your family and then to take that back to your community and be a model of that. Because I would love everybody to take what you feel now back to your community and start spreading that out because people need that. And that's what people are missing. And that's why people are ending up in this weird spiral that they're in right now, I think. You got anything to add, Ryan? Oh boy, it's all been covered. It seems like, but um, <clears throat> you know, I was thinking back. You know, I think a lot of people uh, relate mental toughness in the hunting space to maybe uh, you know bebopping off the mountain a little ahead of time. Like they 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 can't keep their mind in the game, so they they maybe have left a little before they should. And I think probably everybody up here has done that. I know I have back in the day. Uh, in my twenties, I did not have the mind game that I have now. And I think a result, you know, was just, I wanted it so bad. I was so driven to be successful, um, that it, it caused me to add another day, like go out for two nights solo, add another day, add another day to the point where, you know, you can be comfortable in there for weeks in your own head and, um, not have that kind of that draw pulling you out back to the trailhead, which we used to feel for sure. Um, but I was kind of forced to hunt solo back in the day and I still wanted to hunt as much as I could. And I had set goals for myself on killing mature animals, but to be able to do that, I just realized like, I got to get it together. And so I just need to create this person that can be back there comfortable. And, um, you know, I think if you have like the goal of killing a, say a, just a giant mule deer and you want to be as successful as somebody like Brady has, you know, over the years. And you've got this really impressive resume of doing it over and over and consistently, um, without the mental game, you're just, it's not going to happen. You know, it's just not, you know, um, 
whitetail guys obviously are not going to have nearly the mental game as a Brady Miller. <laughs> they just, <laughs> this is not going to happen, right? <laughs> Can I say that? Yeah. Um, tree stand hunting just isn't going to cut it. But uh, <laughs> I think if you uh, if you grab a uh, you know a mule deer tag out west and you set the goal of killing a a real old mature crusty, um, you better have your mental game tight or it's probably not going to happen. You'll probably end up walking out ahead of when you should have. I mean, just these guys really touched on it, and these guys are some of the toughest dudes out here for sure. I'm privileged to get to hunt with them, but you know, I get asked all the time, and I mentioned on the last Q&A was, you know, what's the transition been between how you hunted, you know, before I was doing stuff with Gritty, and it was like, it really, nothing has changed when it comes to the hunting side of things. I get more days, yes, but... What started me was 16 years old, going out on my first solo hunt. It was a one night, and it was hard. And then the next year, it was like I went two, three days. Ryan touched on it. And what you have to do is just start doing the hard thing. Whatever, like now, I've always been fearful of snakes. Like I hate snakes with a passion. But I've got to the point where now, like, I'm okay with a snake, and I'll actually grab a snake. Not a live snake, but I've got to the point where I'll touch a dead snake. (laughs) Still won't grab a live one. But that's just something that you have to do the hard thing. And every time you do the hard thing and the more you do that hard thing, the easier it becomes. Like with us spending 10, 20, 30 days, we could go 365 days a year on the mountain. Comfortable as can be, no worries, as long as we had some food. Like we've been doing it so and much. And if they didn't have so wives. Easy. And if we didn't have wives. No, we're grateful for our wives because they allow us to do that and hold the fort down at home. You know, we're blessed to have wives like that. So just doing the hard thing because, you know, my hardest thing is going to the gym. I don't like the gym, but instead of going to the gym, I'll throw on a 150-pound backpack and I'll go hike two and a quarter miles as hard and as fast as I can do that. I may not be throwing iron around, but I'm still doing hard things to keep my body physically fit and my mind to, to still do that stuff. I think we have to thank Hillary Lampers because if there wasn't a Hillary Lampers, we would not know Ryan Lampers. That's right. I uh, was on a hunt with Ryan. I don't remember maybe a year or two years ago. And there's, we're in the middle of nowhere and there's this cabin out there. Nobody lives there. It's just some old, it's the middle of nowhere. We're hunting. I think it's like day 15 or something. And, uh, we have to leave. Like we've tagged out, I think on a couple, but we still had some tags left, which is hard for Ryan to ever quit. If there's still a tag in his pocket, and so he's upset. He's mad because we, we have to leave. It's like finally it hit that point where he's got no choice. And maybe it was the end of the season. I don't know. But we're walking out and he looks back at that cab and he's staring at it. And he goes, you know what, Brian? If I didn't have a wife and kids, I'd figure out how to live in that cabin and I would never leave it. <laughs> so, and I was like, I believe you. <laughs> um. I want to add one thing to what we all said here. Um, Frederick Nietzsche said, uh, he who has a why to live to a why to live for can bear almost any how. So when you do think about like I, in my mind, I always kind of have the why, like, why am I doing this? What, what do I want? And that, if I cultivate that properly, I have motivation. And sometimes that why is rooted in like, I want to make a positive difference. Sometimes it's, I want to prove somebody wrong. Sometimes that's a stronger motivation for me. And that's why it's good to have friends that shame you. And then they kind of keep you pushing harder. I remember one time I was about to come home on a solo elk hunt. I think it was my first real long, serious solo hunt. And I missed this bull twice because I, I had the dial to 70 and I forgot and I shot and I, I did it two times in a row before I figured out what was wrong. I only had like three days left in the season. It was pouring rain. I stuck it out for like another four days and hadn't seen an elk. I was really discouraged and I texted Ryan about how bad it sucked. And I was kind of thinking about going home because I was probably not going to get anything anyway. And he texted back and said, well, there's like, basically there's nothing to go home to except being a loser. I'm paraphrasing, but it's kind of what he said. So I was like, well, hell, I ain't going home. Uh, And then I shot at my my best solo bull, you know, my, one of my first, so my first solo bull. And, um, and, uh, you need, you need some 
I think you need somebody out there. If you can get that person, um, you know, to, to really pressure you and, and help you along, that certainly is huge. But have a why. Question. This question is for Ryan, the man that talks so much. Uh, I'm TJ V Hill with, uh, I'm from Idaho. Uh, you know, when we went, when I went to the crazies with you a couple of years ago, there was what a dozen or so of us. And we had, I don't know, eight, maybe a dozen glassing sessions. And it seemed like every time you were spotting those, those critters every time the first time, and there's 12 of us on the mountain. And I'm just curious, other than the obvious of patience, what is it? And I think I talked to Gritty about this and maybe a few use, but um, what's a couple of the key things that you do that make you so good at what you do at that? At the glassing? <clears throat> Boy, that's a good question. I don't even know if I can answer that question, honestly. I can answer that Experience. question. Experience. <laughs> but it, yeah, it is. It's, uh, I think, competition, number one. Me and Brian have talked about that. Uh, we're always in competition for spotting animals and we've coined this, uh, ye who spots them, gots them. Right. So when you're around other people, you're doing anything and everything that you can to try to spot the animal first. So, um, you know, you're first taking a glance at the hillside and then you're just really dialing it in. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it's the glass we use, um, necessarily, but, um, I think it's, it's just that it's, it's competition with, with the guys that I hunt with. And, uh, so far, I mean, with Brian, I can out hike him. So I get to the glassing spot ahead of him and I have all this time to, <laughs> to find these animals. Now with He's Brad, that's not the case. <laughs> that's why I like to go, you go to that Ridge and yeah. I'll go to the, so I, if I have enough, if I can get there, I can find it. <laughs> It's just he gets yeah. there first a lot of times. Brad hikes as fast, if not faster than me. So that that's not the case anymore. So I have to have my game. And then it just becomes a, a competition. But um, I think like Brian Barney said, experience. You know, you, we've just done it for so long. You just kind of have a knack um, for where you should be looking and where you shouldn't be wasting your time, you know, especially for a mule deer. And, uh, what's that quote you say, Brady, uh, it, mule deer hunting isn't a science. It's, it's not an art. It's, it's, yeah. Mule deer hunting is an art and not a science. Is an art, not a science. And I think that comes from doing it so often for so long. You just kind of get this natural ability to look into the right areas. I think one of the things, uh, that I noticed the first time, cause I had hunted with a lot of people, a lot of talented people, but nobody that could spot every animal like on a hillside. Um, it was uncanny sitting there watching Ryan glass stuff. And I'd be like, where, where there's nine up there. And then I didn't want to say, I didn't see the same nine. So I would be like, damn, I only see three. Where are these other, you know, six deer. And I'd spend 20 minutes trying to find them. And, and eventually I could find them all mostly. And then I have to ask Ryan, okay, I, I found seven. Where's the other two, you know, and then he'd show me and he could just look and go, got it, got it, got it. There was a, a sheer amount of time that I noticed that Ryan just never put the glass down. So from the moment, moment the sun came up to the moment the sun went down, he just never put it down. I'd hunted with guys who glass for a while, chill all day, glass for a while, chill all day. I can't think of how many animals we just giants, you know, that we, when we do see a big deer, it's just barely going over a hill gone it only probably was up for one moment you only had that one glimpse that probably happened to us throughout the week but we just didn't happen to have our glass in that spot at that very moment but after 10 days of doing that we got lucky we i mean we, we put in the hours and we just barely got that one glimpse that's all we needed now we go and we kill that giant deer it's time behind the glass. And then as I've tried to compete with Ryan, so I can actually shoot something, uh, it's caused me to stay in the glass for long periods, just like that. Never put them down. And as, uh, and then all those hours of practice have made me much more talented and skilled at spotting game. And so it's just time behind the glass. 
and you get better and better and better. You know, I've watched these guys, Brad, too. You know, good. I'm, guys, there's no downtime. When these guys get to a glassing spot, it's a race to get the packs off. Stealthy pads are out. You're down. There is no chit-chat. And, I mean, I know people want to think Lambert's just combing his hair up there and stuff, but <laughs> um, it's packs off, pads down, glass up. That fast. And um, it, it's competition, but a little bit, but... There's no rest. It can be blazing hot, 90 degrees. There's not an animal moving. They're still glassing. For that one chance, he's going to show himself, right? Yeah. Most people are going back to camp. They're glassing in the morning. They're glassing in the evening. They're getting there an hour after daylight. They're like, oh, man, we got to hike back to camp. We got to walk down the trail for a mile. We better If we head now, we can get to camp at dark. That is not. That never happens. Well, I'll say this too, like, yes, it's a competition always, like we're very competitive, but we want to see our partners su- succeed just as much as we succeed, you know, and, and if Ryan spots a bear, I spot a bear, maybe Ryan's already tagged out, he spots the bear, guess what, who's on the list next? Me. Uh, you know, we like seeing each other succeed and we're a team, we bring the fil- films together, being a team, everybody's success is what we care about most. I think. Unless it's a wolf. I want to remind people that you hear it. You don't get it. I rem- remind years people. Years. If you've seen this <laughs> film where, uh, team Pedro gritty were stomping lampers. Uh, and Brady definitely was flagging. The Hubble telescope wasn't so He great. was getting his butt kicked. And then late Brady got a hot streak and yeah, he was seeing up. everything and it was starting to catch up. And that's, you'll go through these ebbs and flows too. It's like, Pedro just happened to spot it a millisecond before Ryan, like six times in a row. It was really pissing Ryan off. It was really fun to watch because it doesn't happen very often. Yeah, I noticed uh, good question. the other day we were out here, Mark and myself, we're out there just glassing for animals, sheep and and, uh, and elk, and he uh, he pulled one over on me. He he raced out there and got his glass up before I could even get my glass up. And he he saw this great bull and he laid claim to it already. So yeah, no, we started the exact same moment. <laughs> no, and I just I, I may be, I may not remember correctly, but I remember the very first time Ryan and I it was like twenty twenty one or something. Ryan and I hunted together for the first time, like just us, and we got to the glass now, and I feel like. There was a conversation between Ryan and Brian at the end of it, and Ryan's like, "I don't know what I, I don't know if I like Brad." <laughs> and so I'm like asking Brian, like, "Well, why?" And he's like, "Well, he beats me all, or is right behind me to the top of the mountain." And he's like, "Most guys don't do that." <laughs> so <laughs> a glassing advantage, <laughs> yeah, faded. But it's fun. Good question. Uh, Casey from Washington. So I'm 40, just started hunting. Uh. I guess what I'm, you guys talk about mentorship and you hold these things. And what my question is, hunting has saved me or just helped me get through some of the hardest times just recently in my life. So, and I can go into that, but it's like, what does it mean to some of you guys beyond food or antlers or anything else? Like some deeper dive into, uh, it seems to be this like spiritual thing for me almost. So I'm kind of curious. Um, what do you say to a guy like me? You know, what does it mean above everything else? I mean, hunting has been in our DNA since the time of man and with all the busyness and stuff. And you go spend a few days out there, you learn to find yourself again, where you get the rush of people, the city. There's just something about the quietness that really will bring you back. And then it's obviously better when you have people you can do that with as well but it just i don't know i think there's something primal about it that really brings us back to our forefathers and you know how they taught us our dads um yeah i don't think there's anyone on the panel who probably answer better than brian yeah. barney mm-hmm. yeah it's the um it's the passion yep it's uh, to have something you love with every fiber in your being that you're willing to 
uh, sacrifice for, that you're willing to put in all the work, that you're willing to work 365 days a year to try to give yourself a chance at success. Like, to me, it's everything. Like, having that passion, I just don't feel lost. I feel like I have, like, a purpose. I feel like I have something a goal that I can work hard towards. I feel like I can challenge myself mentally and physically. Like life is uh, so nerfed nowadays and so safe with seat belts and water that comes out the tap to be out and and to be in these rugged uh, extreme places and to be able to challenge myself to my core. It means everything to me. It's what makes me a better man, makes me a better husband, better at work, better father. Like it just gives me drive and satisfaction and fulfillment in life. So, I mean, to me, it's everything. I would second that. Like he said, like, like Brian call said, Brian Barney would say it the best. Yeah, man. Uh, for me, it's a competition against myself too. It's uh, the ultimate level. I played high school sports. Uh, I never went to college sports, but I needed that extra, that fix. Like I need something to push myself and keep my mind, that mental game. It's the ultimate push. There's nothing. I'm not a marathon or anything. This is my marathons. These are my, those mountains, these, this game we play, chasing it. And when I get out there, that's why I think I like the solo game so well. I don't have, I have a, my best friend and we hunt together a little bit or I hunt my wife a little bit, but the solo hunts. Those are the ones that are like you dig deep. Every decision is you're on you. It's just like it mimics life to the fullest, in my opinion. In my every decision you make, it's on you. Everything you do, the success is on you. The failures on you. It's the ultimate competition, and you're going. It's man against beast, and those critters out there will whip you every time. So when you succeed, it's a it. The feeling is is uh. It's it's. I, I live for it, man. I can't I can't explain the feeling that I get. Not just the kill, but Cause I'm, I'm in tears most of the times. Like it's, it's that gratifying when I get an animal on the ground. If you saw me by myself, man, like you guys maybe seen like a film here or there where I'm, I'm jacked, <laughs> but it only captures a little bit of it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it crushes me when I, when I, when I put a good arrow in something and I get to actually put my hands on it and 365 days of this, you take the time away from the family and that's, that's my why and that's my drive. And, uh, I wouldn't be the guy I am if I couldn't get to the mountains and hunt. Mm-hmm. The other Same. thing too is hunting is something that, you know, it's great to have friends that do it, but it's something that you can always do on your own by yourself. And you can still share it, like do it by yourself, but still have a awesome support group in this community and with others mm-hmm. to share it with. Cause Sam, you talk about going solo, but you have some hardcore buddies. I do. And you all keep track of each other, like, by the day, it seems oh, like. Oh, yeah, man. We, there's about five of us. And, like, I'm very fortunate in that. Like, everybody always looks for hunting partners. And there's this crew. I I went to high school and college with some guys. And we started bow hunting. We were all, like, 14, 15 years old. And we still, we all have families now. And we still. And, I mean, you want to talk about holding each other accountable. We all work out. We all work out separately. We all shoot our bows. When we go to an archery shoot, we'll all enter with each other. You want to talk about, you hear these guys talking crap? My boys, like, we, it's all competition. We have a Snapchat. I know that sounds funny. We have a Snapchat group. We call it every year. So, like, we're last year with the 2022 killers, four out of five. Like, who didn't kill an elk? You're the odd man out, right? You always, or it's five out of five. I know that sounds silly, but every single thing we do is accountable. There's been multiple times where you'll hit service and you'll get Snapchat and no kidding, we had three guys bowl down, bowl down, bowl down. All three of us, different areas, probably scattered over 200 miles. Each one of us, nobody's helping anybody pack because everybody's <laughs> got their own bowl down on the exact same day. September 18th, uh, 2000, or September 11th, 2018, and we all hit, three of us killed bulls on the same evening. I mean, so when you got guys pushing you like that, they might not be right there, but that's that ultimate why too. And we create some competition between I, they're, they're guys. None of you guys will see on Instagram. They're quiet. Nobody knows them, but they're, I run with some studs that I'm very fortunate that I do. And over the years, cause they've pushed me. You, you can still have the vehicle of hunting, you know, that allows you to have really close relationships with people who share that same passion. And yet you don't have to hunt together to still have that community. You can hunt solo, like Sam just said, and still have that community. And I think community is something that the modern man is really uh, lacking. You know, church going isn't like it used to be. There's The Rotary Club isn't like it used to be. You know, we're all lacking. I found community at a CrossFit gym. They were like my... 
they're like family, you know? And then these guys are family too. And it's, it's that community, the part that really drives me, you know, if you don't mind sharing what, I mean, what's your answer to the question you asked? <laughs> I don't mean put you on the spot. No, it's fine. I just want to get the words out. Right. So, um, I grew up without parents really like no dad. My mom was there, worked at night. I never saw her. Uh, I really had no influence in my life. I've kind of made all my own mistakes to make a long story short, but, uh, um, a lot of hard times met my wife when I was like 30 things seemed to get better. And then I've struggled with that mental game because of the past. And I almost like live in regret sometimes if that makes sense. But, uh, a couple of years ago, things just got to be a lot, right? So, like, I was 30 pounds lighter. I'm not eating. I'm, like, going to the dark side. I got a th- two little baby boys. Um, I don't know how to be a parent, right? So, uh, no one does. I mean, I just didn't have any to teach me. I didn't have – well, I learned what not to do. Um, <laughs> but – uh when I had those kids and my little brother died the same year, my first baby that I lost died. Uh, and we lost another one two years later. And then we had two more baby boys and all of that. Um, just me and my wife, we were the only people we had to turn to, but I had just had a lot of other things, the business, everything kind of dragging me down. So like a year ago, I had to make a change. I gave up anything bad I was doing. I just, some, one of my buddies, like we call each other best friends. We barely ever talk, but it's like, he's got to get you hunting, man. Got to get you hunting. And my family had an L camp growing up, but my dad wasn't there. I never got to go. I just heard stories at a reunion or something like that. Like I didn't know anything. I never shot a gun. I never been around it. And then I did it. And, uh, like I have not slowed down for a second. I changed my nutrition. I changed everything, diet, exercise, built the gym, spent every extra dollar I had to pursue this, sold everything that I thought I didn't need, like changed my life. And I no longer am in the dark side. And I, uh, I just owe it to like a lot of you guys and your podcast. And I've never been influenced by anyone. And it was a, it was kind of a hard shock to be influenced by guys younger than me, older than me. Um, so what you do, I guess what I'm trying to say is what you do means a lot to a lot of people you probably don't know about. <laughs> um, so well, thank you. Thank you. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> It's a great story. I'm not crying. You're crying. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to make Brian cry now for sure. Man. One thing I've noticed with these. Oh, sorry, Mark. I was going to say, Mark didn't have any parents either. I didn't have them. My dad was was terrible. I was on a path like you. I was lucky that I had some uncles and stuff. I was exposed to hunting stuff, but I really had to pull myself out too a little bit. Not... Dude, my story didn't pales in comparison to yours, but it's a community that's gonna it's gonna be like this forever. Just can't let go of it. I appreciate being able to meet everybody behind me as well. I mean, these guys have each other and now, you know, I feel like I got some of you guys. Maybe not specifically, maybe someday. I mean it's just it all means so much. So Appreciate that. I Olin showed up in an OG gritty shirt, gritty Bowman from way back in the day. Um, and uh mentioned uh you know how that impacted him. And it makes everything that we do, you know, feel worth it, you know. So uh big gratitude to all of you as well. You guys, these all these guys up here and including myself. You wouldn't have been able to squeeze any tips out of Ryan 20 years ago, any of these guys, right? We, 
everybody up here, I think, that went through a cycle where it was like, oh, I'm keeping my stuff tight, right? <laughs> my hunting spots, my this, what I know, what I don't know. But we came to a point, I mean, they said it earlier, man, we we knew it was time to give some back. And it was weird how we all got together because we all didn't do it together. We all didn't get together and say, hey, let's start doing it. You know, we all started doing it individually and we all found each other. And, um, but we're committed to it. I mean, does it cost us? Heck yeah, does it cost? We lost our bear. Well, it wasn't my, I, I was, <laughs> I came in their second year after, but we lost a great bear spot this year because it's been out there too many, too many movies were made, too many features, filmed, whatever it was, too many people told too much. Wasn't me. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that's the way it goes, right? That's the way it goes. We'll just go find a new spot. And, um, but we love it, man. We love giving back. I mean, I've been living at these summits for four years and I can't think of a, I don't even know what I would do in June if I wasn't doing these things. So I love every minute of it. Another question. So my name's something not so heavy. (laughs) Slightly related. Uh, this is my second summit. I was at the 2021 as well. And one of the biggest things that tripped me out a lot coming in is, Very similarly, I hunted as a kid, but then got away from it and came back and meeting you guys. It's weird because we hear voices through podcasts or we see you on videos. And the thing that I've heard for three years was we're just dudes, you know, we haven't changed, but, um, from our end, do you guys feel what we feel as in, I don't want to say influencers because that's a, it's not what you guys are to us. You know, you're guides, role models, inspiration. Do you guys struggle to feel that as you've gotten bigger and bigger and the summit's 40 people now? And as this thing has grown, do you guys kind of, I don't want to say feel pressure, but do you guys feel the weight of the change that you're causing? I mean, we had 25 people, I think Hillary said, come back again to another summit. I mean, there's a reason for that. So do you guys feel that on your end as this platform's grown and you guys have gotten more popular and bigger? I asked Joel the same question because he went on Rogan and now he's making all this money and everyone <laughs> wants his time. You feel the pressure? I love it, man. I mean, <laughs> I just, I want, I'm seeking impact. I need enough money to live, but I'm seeking impact. And that's why I come to these things and it's, it's amazing for me. I learn as much from you as you learn from me and I, I just, the impact that we're having, we feel it and that's what we thrive on. And so I don't see it as a pressure to produce or anything like that because what we're, we know that what we're putting out is what people are seeking, right? Obviously with all the return people that we have here. And uh, I think that we all just thrive on the impact that we're having and we see that and, and uh, yeah, I just, I love it. And these things are such a cool, I wish Man, can you imagine if we had something like this when we were younger? Oh, yeah, my exactly. goodness. It would be so awesome. Look at all the teary-eyed guys up here. I don't know. Including myself. I can't believe it, to be honest. <laughs> but, I mean, if that doesn't tell you how into it they are, I don't know what else is. So. I'll tell you what. So, I'm like, I'm different than all these guys. These guys all have big platforms. Like, they they were all, they started somewhere, right? I'm just a bow hunter. I'm just like you guys. Like, that's the way I look at it. And like, I look up to these guys. Like I sat on Instagram. I saw these guys on Instagram. I listened to Gritty's podcast six, seven years ago. Gritty Bowman podcast. Listen to all of them. Eastman's Elevated. Listen to all of them. Red. I remember I can almost picture the articles that Brian Barney was putting in Eastman's before he was an Eastman's writer, right? When he was just a bow hunting dude. Like, so I've looked up to him that long like me and my buddy zach my best friend we always joke about barney he's like i remember he puts up that 200 inch mule like i remember those pictures when those pictures pop back up now it's like i remember when i first started seeing lampers there's pictures of him that i remember and it's because it's old days the pacific northwest high country mule deer gnarly pictures he's got like shorter beard and stuff he looks like a little bit of a different guy i remember i wasn't trained to hunts and i got <laughs> into nationals i got married the weekend of nationals so i didn't go compete but I remember there was this Ryan Lampers guy I was hearing about when they got to Wyoming to ours, and they're like, Ryan Lampers is a stud. You, if you can, you know, you got it. And I didn't, that was the first time I heard about him, and I never made it to Nashville this year. My wife and I got married, like I said. So I'm just like you guys. I look up to these guys, and now there's, you just got to, 
but we all do it because we love it. I, my wife made me get Instagram to post pictures because she, I grew up with a dad that was a guide. So I was forced to take no tongues hanging out. We want clean blood. You want to do a good representation of the animal. I, t- luckily, I'd had a lot of kills as a kid. All my pictures were high quality. I loved it. My wife's like, you need to put those pictures up. There's people that want to see like the stuff that can be done. And I, I mean, they started out when I was 14. You see, if you've seen any of my old Instagram pictures, I was 14 years old, all the way up to 38. Now it's just been hunting my whole life. I'm just a dude. We're all just dudes and like, we're nobody like, right. I mean, we just love it. And, uh, so I'm, everybody introduced themselves. They have something. I'm, I'm a bow hunter. Like that's it, man. And so it's for me now, I don't let it get to your head. If you let it get to your head, you can turn into a real jackass. Mm-hmm. I think that in anything. You look at NFL players, there's a lot of just good dudes out there. There's Logan Wilson. He plays for Cincinnati Bengals. He's a Wyoming boy. He came back home, puts on free football camps at the high school that he played high school football at. You can talk to him at a Hardee's, and he will sit there and BS with you. So we're just guys. That's why I love going out. Like If you're with me in my shooting group, I like laugh at it because I don't, I don't look. I'm like I ask you guys questions. Like We're just people, man. I do appreciate the bigger tent, though, Mark. <laughs> it took a lot of pressure on Lampers. <laughs> I said, Lampers, we got to upgrade our game. You know, Ryan? Just, Lampers like, oh, we'll just throw up a couple tarps. Everybody will just eat dehydrated meals. We'll just hike everywhere, just live off the land. I'm like, Lampers. Mark and Amy have actually made this a real event because if Ryan had his way, you guys would be in your bivy socks oh, out yeah, on you. the prairie eating dehydrated <laughs> meals for four you days. You guys would so. be mosquito bitten. <laughs> sunburn <laughs> and you'd be definitely be lost yeah because there would be no directions <laughs> no waypoints no nothing we're no just gonna, hey, we're gonna meet up on this hill about five and a half miles see it dark it's not on it's true <laughs> communication's uh, great i want to ask ryan because like i honestly don't think about it i i don't think about how far my reach is i try not to think about if i make it like i just try to do what I'm passionate about doing and whatever happens, happens. I don't put it in my mind. I don't dwell on whether, what, how, how big or how big the stage is or the platform. I just don't. Um, Ryan has been an obscure hermit for years and years and years. And I remember saying something to him one time, probably about his lack of communication skills on a hunt. And he says to me, he says to me, like, almost in exasperation, I'm not used to someone being here with me. Uh, so, yeah, I don't I don't communicate well because I do this by myself and you're kind of crowding me with the camera. So let's just, you know, work through this. Uh, so my question to you, Ryan, is um, you're in the spotlight now. Uh, people uh, love you. They appreciate what you do. You are one of the best uh, hunters I think I've you know that I've ever personally met. Uh so um do you feel uh, you know you have to feel some pressure, some difference. What what goes through your mind? I know you don't care too much what people think. <laughs> I don't. Um <laughs> man. So I too like Sam, like I wasn't into social media or anything. I hunted solo most of my life. I just considered myself a, a hunter that, that wanted to be successful. And, uh, if my family, well, my family was about the only people that knew about it, which was great. But then Hillary started the old Instagram account and got me rolling on that thing. Those um, dang wives. <laughs> uh, she got, yeah, she threw the first few posts out and she said, you should just share some pictures and stories. And, you know, I, I fought it in the beginning, didn't really want anything to do he with it. He said his number one goal was to never make a comment on social media. <laughs> so I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> I quickly realized, like, uh, there is value and and uh, the community opened up a ton. Um, you know, we like to belittle social media a lot. It's easy to do. It's an easy target. But at the same time, it is a great place to meet like-minded folks, good folks uh, without it. I, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have met Brian all those years ago to train to hunt. We wouldn't be hunting partners now. So um, it's got just as much of an upside with with how it can um, put people together. So you know, I don't know. I I really enjoy it. I'll I'll be the first to admit. Like I enjoy, and it's probably because I don't have to have physical conversations with people because that's awkward for me. But 
I can just sit there and give responses to the best of my ability to people who ask questions. And uh, I do like that. I have enjoyed that, even though it does take away a lot of family time at the end of the day. You know, a couple hours at the end of the day is burnt up on doing that. But I've found it um, makes me feel good. Now, do, did, I mean, in, in my 20s and 30s, it would not have made me feel good. I wouldn't have done it. You know, I was very selfish with my time, and uh, I didn't want anybody to know about hunting. Less people on the mountain meant more success for me, most likely. And that's not the case now. Um, now, you know, you get to a point, I've got daughters, so I want to see a future for them like we've gotten to experience, you know. I want them to have opportunities when they grow up. And without sharing this thing that, that we've become somewhat good at and we try to inspire people to do it and realize it exists, without that, I, I don't know that my daughters are going to have the same opportunities that, that I had growing up. So it's a long winded answer, but, um, yeah, I don't feel like pressure to do it. I, I kind of enjoy it. Um, even though as you guys probably witnessed at this event, uh, I'm pretty awkward in conversation, but I am happy to answer questions for sure. That's probably the most Ryan has said in one setting since <laughs> I met him. Yeah. Another question. Uh, yeah, I had a question for you guys. My name is Ricky. I'm from California. Um, last year, I was blessed uh, to have my first baby girl. Uh, she just turned a year um, two weeks ago. So I'm stoked on that. And one of the reasons I got the approval from uh, my very supportive wife to come here is, aside from you guys being phenomenal hunters, is uh, she sees and hears how great of fathers you guys are. Um, and watching Sam's Instagram stories of him hunting with his little girl, taking her antelope hunting, and the videos you guys have put out of uh, Ryan um, taking uh, his daughter's hunting now, which is awesome. Um, so my question is, as a young father, what changes did you guys make when you started a family um, to help find balance between kind of work, hunting, and trying to be there for your family? I hear Brian Barney say it all the time is, when you're home, being present. Um, I got three boys. Life's about to get real fun. <laughs> but uh yeah, just being present. There was a time in my life where I was working on the railroad and I'd come home and I brought that crap home with me. <laughs> I was a jackass. And uh I was always getting phone calls. I was like a foreman of a big gang and stuff and managers calling you, whatever. And I'd bring that home. And so what I really learned from Barney was being present when I'm home. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And it's this balance uh, between trying to set a really good example for your kids and having them chase their passion and do what they love to do, but also spending the time to nurture them and spend the time with them and to nurture them into good human beings. And, um, you know, it's I have two daughters and they go hunt with me and they're into doing an adventure with dad and the younger one, you know, she might really fall in love with hunting or heck the older one, it might be their thing. But right now they have friends and they have sports and they have school. So my job as a dad is to, to, to be able to encourage them in, in their passions and the things that they love. And, uh, so I find balance with, yeah, being engaged with my family. We eat a meal together every night at the table where there's no TV. There's, we talk, we chat and, and just being engaged, like not bringing problems and issues home. And when I'm with my family, I am with my family, you know, they have my full attention, my full effort. Um, so yeah, I think it's, um, it's definitely a tough balance as it is tough to be away from your family to chase these dreams and chase these these hunting aspirations that we have. But I think it's being just as passionate about your family, getting out in adventures in the summertime, being just as passionate as spending this quality time with your family, uh, being just as passionate about raising your daughter in the lifestyle with the attributes that you really admire that you want them to have. And there's different tools to get there. It doesn't always have to be hunting. It can be 
Uh, my daughter loves basketball, my youngest, and she puts everything into it with her basketball camps and with her teammates and supporting it. Uh, so I really encourage that and I show up and support that. And I'm able to give her insight or give her talks that are like really uh, hit home with her because that's what she loves to do. And so there I'm able to teach her those lessons. So uh, it's definitely not an easy balance, but um, I-, I think all of us try the absolute best we can with the time that we have to to really help, you know, uh, be there for our families and be leaders for our family. Um, I think you, you have to adore your wife. I think you can show your kids what a real relationship should be like. And that's really powerful if you two love each other and you really take care of each other. My wife has always encouraged me to start the podcast, to quit my job, to to travel, to go to another state if I needed to. She was always there to push me and help me feel like I could do anything. And then I was always there to try to build her up and, and help her succeed. And that's powerful, I think, for kids because they see what a healthy relationship looks like. They see that... Um, what they may want to emulate as they get older. And uh, I I think you can start there and it's pretty easy because you guys fell in love for a reason. You decided to have a family for a reason. So you can just keep building on that. Don't let it slip. Don't let it, don't let it get away from you. Or you can raise a son up like Eli that's starting to kick my ass. And uh, (laughs) the biggest mistake I ever made was bringing him out here. (laughs) <laughs> and introducing him to Sam and Barney. He's like, when the first day he's like, dad, man, I love shooting with you, but you think I could go with Brian and, and Sam? I'm like, yeah. And then I hiked with him. He's hiking with me and he sees Barney. I'm like dead meat. He just leaves, <laughs> he just leaves me on the side of the road and gone. And, um, but guys, I love it. I mean, when I could see that, I know that we're doing something right. But he's um, hyper competitive, hyper driven. But it's not me. I mean, some of it's us, you know, right? But bringing him here, exposing him, te- letting him go along, you know, those hunts that we film, and he lives for those. To get that boy to go in a foot and a half snow with just me, minus twenty, whatever it was. But when Brian and Brad were there, and man, he's getting up. You know, they shot a bull. <laughs> Quick story. We were on this glassy knob. We were freezing our asses off. And we were just waiting. And he was learning a lesson about patience, right? We're looking at a bull that we could shoot. He's right there. But I thought it was the same bull that they were looking at. I'm like, we can't shoot it, buddy. What? Can't get it on camera. And he's just like, and he's just freezing. So then we we left a little early to get down the mountain because, you know, we, we really couldn't do anything. They were still on this bull. So we hear the shot. We hear a shot. Or I actually got a text. They killed the bull. And I'm like, oh, they're good. <laughs> they don't need our help. And uh, they can do it. And he's like, we get, a, we get a little more down the trail. And he goes, Dad, we, we should go back. We should go back and help him pack it down. I'm like, oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was such, it was really cool. That he was freezing. But he wanted to go back, you know, and help. And I knew we were going to go back with the llamas next day and get the bull. But no, that the, didn't happen either. One trip. <laughs> yeah. But he was ready to go back. But so it's been nice to see him transform. But the key here is you can be the best dad you can be, right? But I feel like you need also need to put your kids in some role models. Kids really step up their game when they're around other men that have the same, maybe a little above what your skill set is, maybe a little above. And I've just watched Eli. He's just. He's flourished coming to these things. So. Well, it, it validates what they're seeing, hopefully, you know, from you. But there does come a point where your kids start to say, you know, is the old man kind of, is he on? But when you get him in a, a, a setting with like-minded people, then they're like, it, it shores that up. And it, I think confidence for kids is so important, knowing for them to know they're heading the right. And, and like a, a family is like the launch pad, Right. It's like you got to have that foundation so they can stand on that and know that rock's not going to fall. And once they feel confident with that, then they're, I mean, then everything else is just adding to it. And a, and a team like this just strengthens that whole thing. You, you can't you'll be a, successful because go ahead. I think Mark, Joel, and myself are an exception, but have daughters Ryan, Sam, Brian, Barney, 
They all have daughters. Boys are a little harder because <laughs> like me, you know, I love hunting with these guys. I love hunting with my dad, but at the same time, like getting to the point now where my oldest is 10. So I'm doing a little more with them, you know, just because I want that experience with my boys. So I will say <clears throat> what you do is what you teach. We've talked about being an example. What you do is what you teach. So what I see is a lot of people that will say one thing, try to teach one thing, but they do something completely different. They're not listening to what you say. They're watching what you do. So what you do is what you teach. And if you if you follow that principle, you'll change maybe some of the things that you do. And just on a side note, you know, I know what you do for a living. You see a lot of crazy things. So just be careful. Don't let that define you, right? Like I spent 20 years as a cop and I, I just never let that define me. It was just something that I did between hunts, right? So that's saying, um, I can't hear you because your actions are yelling so loud or something, something. Yeah. Like that. My wife and I always tell it to our kids, your actions speak louder than your words. And as parents, that's something that we try and do. I will say as being the wife, and I think all the other wives that are here can attest to this, is that we were all wives to these guys before these guys all knew each other. And uh, I think that, uh, geez, you guys got me crying. What the <laughs> heck? This is Man, so this weird. This is like emotional. Heavy. I, just, I, I think it's just so cool to see a group of men who we've, you know, we've been married 26 years. So we've lived like almost three different lifetimes together. Right. And just the transformation that I've seen in my husband with this community, with this group of men and his ability, one, to ask for help and to um, want to be and wanting to just do something like this. I mean, that that transformation is not something that just comes on by yourself. Like Gritty attested, like if we had never done this and the podcast and he'd never done Gritty Films and we'd never gone to that, he'd never gone to that train to hunt. Like we would not be sitting here because that was not his momentum in life. And it took having a group of people like this to make him realize, like, this is important information that I need to share. And then in that, the wives, we, like, benefit from that, you know, and our kids benefit from that because that's not the direction it was going before this. And when all you guys come here and, you know, it's only three or four days and Everybody, the last day, nobody wants to go home. Everybody just wants to stay here. We all, t every single time we do these, we wake up on the last day and we're all like, oh, it's the last day. You know, we're all sad about it because it's really important to have this camaraderie in your life. And we realize that because we basically live like a single, co you know, we lived as like a single unit for over 20 years of our marriage, you know, having our nuclear family and then not ryan had like one friend and he didn't like any of my friends so he never <laughs> hung out with any of them <laughs> so you know now it's like we actually have friends together and i think that's what your wife is is hinting at is like these might be people that i would actually be friends with and that's the most important thing and that's what we want to come across as Ryan. If you ever call Ryan a celebrity or an influencer or something like that, he will like yell at me. And Ryan doesn't yell very often. He'll just be like, no, like, <laughs> don't use that swear word around here. Right. Because he's just that's but you guys know him. So and that's the other thing. People will come up to me and just start telling me their entire medical history. And like, I've never met them before. And I'm like, and he'll be like, wow, people sure tell you a lot of stuff. And I'm like, well, because they feel like they trust us and they know us from this. But when you come to this, you see like we all have struggles and no marriage is perfect. No relationship is perfect, even though Gritty and Suzanne have a perfect marriage. Don't, don't like look at theirs. No, I'm just kidding. But like nobody's perfect and we all struggle. You know, Ryan and I have businesses together. You really want to see if your marriage can last? Start a business together. 
it's really hard to do. It's a struggle because you're different. You have different like ideas, ways you want to go about stuff, you know, and this is no different. So the whole reason that we've been able to do this is because of these people that give us input, that are kind, that are loving, that would have our backs in a second. And we don't have to talk to them every day. We just know that. So find old men for friends. Lovely father figures to you. <laughs> like being a girl dad, uh, I wanted a girl. I wanted a girl more than anything because I wanted her to be able to whoop all the boys' asses. <laughs> and luckily, my wife is uber competitive, probably more competitive than me. <laughs> this will get me choked up now, but um, she's my rock. Like, and having that mom that has that, she's got so much grit and she's an introvert. I'm the Hillary in the relationship and. My wife, Peyton, is the Ryan. Like, she's quiet. She sits back. She's chill. But, like, she pushed me to quit my job, do what I'm doing now, um, to do stuff like this. I mean, like, when Ryan called me a year ago, it's like, do I want to go, like, am I, can I hang with these guys? You know, she's like, go with it. Um, I've had opportunities with Stone Glacier that I question, you know. It's like, I didn't know if I was, like, worthy enough. And she pushed me to do that stuff. As much confidence as I have, you still check yourself. You don't want to be, you know, there's a fine line between confident and cocky. And she's the one that's pushed me to do a lot of stuff. All that being said, I had this little girl and I don't push anything on her. <laughs> but I show her everything that I love. And she might only shoot three arrows out of her bow. And that's it. Like, that's all she wants to do. But, like, I've told the guys, like, I sit in there. I'll be cooking dinner. And I leave the back door open. And I'll hear, she's five years old. And she'll be out shooting her bow by herself. Like, you can't write that up. Or, like, I mean, that all that's on TV, I'll come home and I did a Stone Glacier film recently, and I bet she's watched that buffalo hunt probably 40 times. Like, every time I get up, she'll, I'll get home from the gym in the morning, and she's, she's up early. She's just like her dad. And she'll be up. I'll get home from the gym 5.50. She's five years old, and she'll have a TV on. She'll have her glass of milk, because I always set a glass of milk up for her. She'll have her glass of milk, and she'll be riding right in line at 5.30 in the morning on a Tuesday morning before she goes to preschool. Like, So if you don't think you're having an impact on your kids, if you got your five-year-old that's up or, like, the mule deer hunt I did two years ago, she's four. And she'd be watching that hunt. She tells kids at daycare, Dad, this kid at daycare, his dad saw your hunt. Like, so you don't think you're making an impact? Dude, everything you do, everything you say is, and I'm watching this little four- and five-year-old, and she she digs it. She goes on my backpack. She's getting big now. I tell her she's got to walk up the hills. But I've rolled her. If you guys do watch me on Instagram, you've seen her on my top pack. She rides my top pack, top of every hill, every shed hunt. I don't leave her. I don't leave her. Shed hunting is like it used to be my my jam, 400, 500 horns a year. Like that's all I used to, I used to eat, sleep, breathe. I paid for some of her doctor bills when she was born with shed money. Um, <laughs> But now it's just like it's a, it's fun. Like I'm going to go pick things. Like I'm not taking away family time from that. I'm loading her up in my pack. She goes with me on shed hunts. I started baiting bears strongly because she can go with me and bait her. She didn't slow hunting bears with me, but I can take her and we can watch bears together. Like, so yeah, that's how I, that's how I changed. You asked how I, how we changed. That's how I evolved. I saved the whitetail hunts for, I put in, I don't put in for late season Wyoming rutting mule deer hunts anymore. Cause I can put in for an extra whitetail buck tag. I can do that with her. Like I completely quit putting in for mule deer tags, which I absolutely love. So I can whitetail hunt in November with my daughter. I structured, that's how I've structured it so that I don't need another mule deer, right? Like that, I'm going to get a hunt general mule deer somewhere else. I can go do that. And I would rather go hunt whitetail on the edge of some field and rattle and get her to see that excitement with me than, so it, it, I have evolved as much as I don't want to like admit it. I my hunting has changed. I still have my hunts where I go dig and I can't wait for the day that, I don't think she's too far out, honestly. Another three years, if I don't push it hard and I do it right, I think I'll be taking on some wild adventures. She's seen bears at 15 yards. She's had bears stand up and look at us both while she's running my iPhone. She's seen things through a headlamp and bears standing on a rock looking at me this year that five-year-olds haven't seen. And I don't know if it's the right way to parent, just like the doc was saying. Like, you don't know if you're doing it right. You're just doing what you do. And uh, I got a girl that's going to be tough. And she's great. One of my tough. favorite videos of Lainey recently on Instagram was like, you're just like in the driveway and here she comes on her horse. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, what are you doing? She's like, you're like riding your horse. She's like, yeah. And she's like five, but she's just riding this full grown horse down the driveway. Like this is a normal everyday occurrence, you know. It's Wyoming, And we man. had her last year. She's not afraid of nothing. Nah, she's, she's tough. Yeah. She'd run all these other kids right out of energy for sure. 
I have uh, some older children. They're about to, I'm about to have them all move out here soon. It's getting close. But I would say one, one thing I'd throw in there among all this with kids and you've got a ways to go, but, um, take away the phones. I mean, I can't imagine like the, the pipeline of garbage flowing into their brain from this device that they're not ready for. They're not old enough to handle. That's just flowing, 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 influencing. And, uh, I thought, well, I just, I'll do that. I'll set that example. I'll do it right. This is a really, really tough thing to compete against. It's hard enough to raise kids as it is, but then you give this to their hand in their hand and you get this pipeline of filth going in their brain. Then you have a much harder hill to climb to instill your values and to teach them and to get them ahead. So don't let them have phones, man. They don't need them. I didn't have them. They'll be 18. And before you know it, They'll get their own phone for the first time, access to the internet, all that. For me, we just went cold turkey a few years ago, and they haven't had a phone since. And I don't, it was the best decision we ever made. We also took them out of public school for two years, and they've been in homeschool. Best decision we ever made. We just circled the wagons, brought them home, and just took away the garbage. And as soon as the garbage was gone, they felt they just, things just fixed themselves. Like going back to the action, speak louder than words. So my boys, damn. <laughs> so they were watching the gritty film this morning. And my wife texts me, don't you gum while you're on camera. So, <laughs> but they're out there watching it, you know? And just like Sam said, I, mean, I do all I can to get those boys out. You know what I think is cool is that you're seeing that what, Brian Barney said, he mentioned passion early on. You're seeing passion to the nth degree right now because we care so much about this and you guys care so much about this that it's awesome. And that's the community we want. Didn't really have a less heavy question. Yeah. <laughs> about okay. You know what I'm about? Arrow setup? Or... <laughs> yeah, anything on Gaia or whatever. Does somebody have a Google Earth question? <laughs> so first of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you for uh, everything you've done. Um, answering questions to just having fun with us. Uh, it's a good community and, you know, I want to ask you, each one of you, what's your favorite part about this event? Um, mine personally is a struggle. I love the hard stuff. I like being pushed by these people next to me, my peers. And, um, you know, I came here 21 Ryan got to hang out with me at the back of the pack, hiking up the crazies, <laughs> <laughs> but I've gotten better because of that. I put myself through hard stuff since, and um, it's been good. And so what's your favorite thing about this stuff? My favorite thing is the brand new release that I got from Joel Turner called the Stan <laughs> on X that has like a click in it. It's what was true. it? The on X, right? Well, Stan on X clicker. X clicker. Yeah. You should buy one. Um, also, uh, money. my favorite, I second that. <laughs> my, my other favorite part was beating Brad in the shoot. That was my favorite yesterday. Part too. He didn't beat me. Look at the final score. Homies. I beat you yesterday. Let's be specific. And that was great. I also crushed him on the mountain run. So I don't no. know what he's talking about. I, who yeah. else has this comment? I would say, you know, I got to sh shoot with Chad and his wife. You guys inspire me. I'm just some little redneck kid from Idaho. <laughs> All right. We'll get it together. I'm just a young kid, you know, like, I get to be lucky to hang out with these guys, be a part of what Ryan does, Hillary does. And then you guys, I see you, and you know, and... I was lucky as a kid. I had my dad do everything with. And then you guys tell the stories where, you know, you didn't have that. And as you guys inspire me, I mean, Chad went, I don't know, eight miles without a complaint in the world. And I complain about a little hurt knee here and there. And he's got a prosthetic leg crushing everyone. I'm like, buck up, you sucker. So, you guys... Must be the Benadryl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my eyes are watering. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. Um, like I said, uh, for me, it's like I like 
I like meeting everybody and I like seeing I was saying Ryan we were talking up on the deck and I was like it's cool this group of dudes like there you guys are hardcore like whatever you think about yourself you don't look you you got these aspirations like you guys are doing it like I hear these stories of where you guys are going like Owen like I know some of the spots he's going and I'm like, you guys are doing it. Like, it's cool to see you're so driven and you want it so much more to learn. Like the year guys stories in Idaho and the rain, like you guys are doing it. You guys are hardcore. Like you just give yourself some credit. Cause I'm sitting here looking at you guys and I'm getting inspiration. I'm shooting against the guys in my group and I had some shooters, man. I've had to like step up my game cause you guys were pushing me to shoot better at my targets. Tom yesterday, man, he was on a roll. I'd go to him, like, I'd, well, he'd go in front of me, 12 ring it, and I'm like, he's got bright yellow fletch, so I had something <laughs> to aim at. But I'm like, this guy, is, it's so it's an inspiration. And just like that, uh, every this is only the second summit I've, I've helped these guys out. But like the first time you pull up to a summit, you get like butterflies in your stomach, right? Ryan Lampers is standing on the deck, long hair just blowing in the wind. <laughs> and you're like, holy smokes, that's Lampers. Or Brian Barney gets out of the truck. My, I'd never met Brian Barney last year. He gets the summit and I just met Lampers and it's like, it's a, it's a shock to me too, guys. I told you, I'm just one of you guys. And, uh, I meet Livesey. I've heard his voice on every podcast. I'm like, this is the guy. This is not what I pictured, but this is the guy. <laughs> but, uh, but no, like, uh, so we get, it's the shooting day to, to, for Brian Barney or it's the shooting day. We're getting ready to load our packs. This is that last year's summit. And I haven't met Barney. And Lampers goes, hey, Sammy, goes, you and Barney in the same group together. He's like, good luck. And I'm like, I've never shot in front of him. I damn sure don't want to shoot with Barney. And I'm like, all right, iron sharpens iron. And like, I'm game. And Barney pulls up. And Lampers goes, hey, hey, Brian, this Sam was talking crap, saying he could beat you. That's the, that's the, <laughs> it wasn't like, hey, Brian, Sam, Sam, Brian. Like, that That was the first conversation. So I think just being around all of you guys and, like, being up with these guys, like, there's there's no, like, one thing that's my favorite. It's just it's this. It's being able to cut up with guys, shoot stories, talk about families, go in depth on hunting, shoot against guys like Chris and Tom and Josh and Phil, like guys that could shoot. Like that was awesome to see how good you guys know your equipment and shoot. It, that's 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 me. That's for me. Yeah, I think it's definitely similar. It's um, it's being able to share an adventure and share an experience. That's like, uh, we all love this so much. It's like to be able to, to go on these hikes and put on the miles and to be able to go shoot these 3d targets and do an overnight and glass, uh, you know, it's like the funnest thing for me. And it's, uh, I don't have too many friends that I have cold beers with. Like I have friends I go do things with, you know, and, and, uh, Ryan and Hillary and everybody involved has cultivated an entire an experience, an adventure, and we get to share it with each other and have these in-depth conversations. Like I, I'm, uh, I, I don't, uh, hold court or, uh, uh, talk in front of a bunch of people. You know, it's like, uh, I have to get up here a couple times a, a summit, but really it's like these one-on-one ones or these small groups of people that I'm able to have conversations with. Uh, so I think for me, that's uh, my favorite part about these summits. For me, it's easily like the friendships. Been to a bunch of these. I mean, a lot of really cool people. And like, I've kept up in touch with a lot of people over years at the summits. And every year we just start chatting during hunting season, sharing photos, emailing back and forth. Hey, what's up? You're going to be here. I've, I've stayed at people's houses from the summit. Like I'm just randomly in a state. They hit me up, say, hey, anytime. But we do it all the time. Talking to a bunch of people here, you know, inviting them down to Vegas. Like, you guys want to come down to Vegas and shoot some rifles? Let's come to Vegas and shoot some rifles. Like, I'm all for the friendships you make here, talking about these small little stories with people. Like, I want to hear their struggles when we're talking about, oh, yeah, that snowstorm that one year in Idaho. I was there as well. Like, that's so cool to, like, hear how they go through a hunt, talk with talk with me as well, and just, like, exchange numbers, exchange emails. Like, this is a community, and I love being a part of it and just seeing everyone's excitement, how we all just love the resource, love the struggles, love the mountains. And it's like, this is home. It's like to be with these people. Joel, favorite part? Oh, my favorite part is when (laughs) I'm out here busting your chops and you are allowing me to affect you and you're nervous and you're punching the crap out of the trigger. (laughs) Then we have a little chit chat right and then my favorite part is when we go out there and you're now shooting with control and you're using me right before you did not want to shoot in front of me now you want me next to you because now you're using me to up your determination that's my favorite part 
before Livesey goes, I'm just going to throw it's in. Cool. We all beat him on the course this weekend. So, help me. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. But, um, <laughs> man, so I get a chance to. I mean, I'm blessed that I get to be here from the very beginning moment <laughs> to the very last target getting pulled. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you, a lot of people think, man, that's a lot of work for you. You know, I mean, dude, it just, I, I don't think I'd do anything else. And, uh, I got to shoot with it, Taylor and Matt. And so, you know, I'm always, I always try to get people to change groups in the <laughs> event biz. I'm like, Ryan, we got to get people to go in another team. So they, and every time we ask, nobody wants to, nobody wants to, because after the first day, you're almost bonded. It's like, dang, they're going to start sleeping in the same teepees and shit. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, it's cool to see that develop. And guys, last week, Brian, I mean, Brad, this ain't no dip. Brad was crying like a baby last week too. And, uh, it's, I'm like, I'm starting to worry. We missed the boy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then this week I got some tears. I mean, so, you know, it's just fun to connect with all you guys. And, you know, we're all serious. I know you guys all think that. Man, I, I don't want to bug them. I don't want to, you know, guys, you spend a lot of your treasure to come here. And even more important than treasure is time. That's what we're here for. We wouldn't do this if we didn't want to stay in touch. Now, maybe you don't want to send us things like, hey, I'm going to Colorado. Where should I go and how should I do it? Maybe not that much big of a question. But Liv will, will give you pins. <laughs> I'll give you all Lambert's pins. Um <laughs> But seriously, reach out to anybody here on this table that you want to afterwards, right? It, it's really um, what we, we love doing it. It's not it's not something we hate. It's um, something we, we kind of do. So that comes with it. It's part of the game. It's true, but I think I have, I don't know, like 50,000 unopened emails. <laughs> so I may or may not get back to you. Usually people go get a hold of Ryan to get a hold of me. Now me. Yeah, I get a lot of those emails. <laughs> so, da, 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 and I'm like, I I'm on. terrible. Anybody terrible. has my don't phone number or email, they don't even bother. They say, hey, will you tell Brian <laughs> this? Yep. Okay. Well, as you guys know, I work in the emergency department. So I'm seeing people shooting their arrows into the dirt. And we've all shot arrows into the dirt. And some of us still are. <laughs> and trees. But the, and trees. But the problem is... Some people don't even care about picking up those arrows. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't going the way you guys oh. think I'm going. No, I'm serious. I, the pe- I'm taking care of a lot of people who I'm seeing the end stage of their whatever. Mm. Okay. And when I'm talking figuratively about them shooting arrows, they don't want to learn to shoot at something besides the dirt. So they're not learning from why that arrow went to the dirt. They don't care if somebody's trying to get them to shoot better. They're just done. And what we got here is everybody shooting their arrows in an upward trajectory and searching for that target. So you may not be unable to shoot arrows into trees occasionally or the dirt. And you may not be shooting the trajectory you want right now, but we're all wanting the target. We're wanting the 12 ring. And that's the positive energy that I can't help but just feel. I mean, it's just so different to feel that here. So I'm cheating. I get my batteries refilled here more than I give. I'm, I firmly believe every time I come here, it's like I can, I'm a way better person leaving here than I came. Well, and you're way broker when you leave here too. A little bit, (laughs) a little bit, a little bit. It's that on X release. It's expensive. (laughs) Yeah. There's a Place. lot of things, everything. I mean, these guys have, have spoke to it really well. You know, obviously the uh, friendships we all have up here, that's one thing. Meeting, you know, people from past events, meeting new people every year. It almost seems like it's 50-50 at each event. Now we get return guys and and new. So whether it appears as such or not, I I, I do really appreciate, you know, shaking everybody's hand and, and meeting new folks and, you um, you know, sometimes in the beginning, I'm not the best at remembering names, but I, I try to, and hopefully by the end, I've got everybody down. But, um, you know, I just love everything that this has turned into, you know, Hill and I, when we started it, we knew what we were hoping it would be. We wanted to, um, kind of build on the community that we had at train to hunt. And, um, 
you know, we feel like it's gotten to that point. Like it's, it's definitely got there. And, and for us specifically, it's, it's much more than what we had even over there when we were doing it. So, you know, we get just as much as hopefully you guys get when you come here and you get to hear from these, these really incredible presenters, you know, um, I hope you guys, like I can speak to, I want to speak to Joel Turner for a quick second. You know, I think <clears throat> I was one of those guys like, holy smokes, you know, I, I, I'm not the best shooter, you know, I punched the crud out of the trigger for years, but I, and when you shoot in front of Joel, you know, it's intimidating as heck, especially for somebody like me. But now I want Joel standing right next to me. I tried mm -hmm. to like selfishly keep Joel Absolutely. by my side the entire, <laughs> so I, just so I would shoot better throughout the course. Cause I know my scores would go up. But um, hopefully all you guys, you know, understand what you got from having Joel here, you know, not just on the shooting, you know, the form and, and the execution and all that, but he's a man of many talents. And uh, you saw that with the bison breakdown and all things, an incredible educator. So having him at these events has been a, a huge plus and hopefully you guys see that. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Um, Nate from Idaho just had a question, um, kind of going back to how this is a 365 day pursuit, um, having to balance things with your other life. Curious from maybe anyone who wants to share like any sacrifices you've had to make, whether that's promotion at a job, um, you know, moving somewhere, maybe another hobby that you really love, but didn't love quite as much as hunting. Um, that way you can maintain that balance with your family or elsewhere. In I, mean, well, I mean, you guys can go, but I'll go first, I guess. I mean, I was making a lot of money at the railroad. Like I had great benefits. I had, um, kind of could do what I want. I could run machinery. I could weld. I could go work labor. Didn't matter. I was making a ton of money, great benefits, but I didn't get to do what I loved hardly at all. Cause when I came home, those six days I was home from the road, I wanted to spend it with my family. So I was like, well, I'm not going to go hunt very much because I want to be with them. And now this has allowed me to, you know, take a massive pay cut and just working harder. Um, the family relationship, like, you know, as a whole, just following my passion for hunting and being in the outdoors, but then also exchanging that passion to hopefully my boys as they grow up and, and they can see that, oh, dad's following his dream. I hope they do the same. Yeah, we made we made big changes back in the day. Um, and uh, that was thanks to my wife, Hillary, here. You know, we made a, a change of, uh, like, location. We were in a place where I had steady work, family business, all things were good, you know, good, clean living. But the environment that we lived in wasn't that great. You know, the coast, um, traffic, standing in line just felt like a daily thing where hours of your day are always sitting in line or, you know, driving somewhere. And so, you know, we made a huge commitment to come over here to Montana. And for me, that was a big leap, you know, for her, not so much. She could work anywhere, but, um, you know, to start a few new businesses that would allow us to be here, uh, to be able to raise our girls here was a big step and I don't think it could have gone any better. Really happy with that move. And it's allowed us to, again, like these guys have said, um, spend a lot more time with them, work from home. I'm not, I hunt a lot, so I'm definitely still on the road, but I'm not on the road driving and, um, and just coming back angry. So, uh, somehow, some way we, we put ourselves in a better place. Um, in the state of Montana. Yeah, I'm just going to say a quick thing about sacrifice. Um, if you if you can't sacrifice something, then you just don't want it bad enough. Um, you know, I went to medical school. You do hard things in your life if you want something really bad, and sometimes you sacrifice. Sometimes people you love, time, a lot of money, um, but in the end, it can pay off. So I think our move. It was just Ryan just couldn't see what else he could do. And it takes somebody else sometimes to just force you to make a change. And once we made the change and you get through that hard part of like what that means to give something up, that that's all, you know, um, 
I think more times than not, it turns out good. But you have to take the leap. And, you know, Ryan used to make a joke about I just jump off cliffs without nets. And he kind of stands at the top and there's no net. You know, he's like, what are you doing? And I'm as I'm running past him jumping off the cliff. So, you know, you, you have to have a good balance, I think, too, in your partnership. And if one person's not daring enough to make it, the other person might be overly daring. And sometimes that overly daring person might be just what you need because they're going to force you to make an uncomfortable change. Sometimes that's just what you have to do, you know, like giving up a bunch of money, giving up a family business and steady, you know, whatever. Um, I think it, you just have to, you know, life is so freaking short. When we got to be almost 50, I was just like, we are not getting any younger. Like we have to make a change because, you know, as people get older, they get harder to change. So that's what I would say about sacrifice. I, uh, I left this hunting summit last year. This is about the exact same date. I went home and gave my two-week notice to a job that I'd been at for 20 years. Had a real good talk with Brian Barney on the deck of the cabin that we were at last year. The morning, last morning, the summit, me and him were drinking coffee. And I'd been kicking around an idea to do a life change. My wife had been telling me that I needed to change for about a year. But it's hard to walk away from 20 years doing the same thing, getting a steady paycheck, carrying the insurance, providing. And I had a good conversation with Barney and... I literally went home, worked a week, gave a two-week notice, and walked away from a job July 18th, 11 months ago now. that, And it was because of a community like this. You want to talk about strength and what it did to me, too. And it takes some guys like Iron Sharpens Iron. I said that yesterday. I was like, yeah, you some of you guys saw me hike out. And I told my crew, I was like, I'm going to catch Barney because that guy's a beast. And uh, just that push and those sacrifices. Yeah, I dropped, I dropped a job. I didn't look at it like that. I mean, yeah, I quit team roping. When I had a family, I quit. I used to team rope quite a bit, rodeoed quite a bit. Took all that. Hunting was more important than any of that. I'd, I hunted, obviously, but when I wasn't hunting, I was rodeoing. Uh, There's all sorts of little things. I was rode snowmobiles, but then the family came, and then it was like, I need to pick one hobby. So, yeah, I, th- those were little those were little gives, right? But now you get around stuff like this, and you learn how much you love something, and Barney opened my eyes, some stuff, Lampers opened my eyes. I mean, his story is exactly the same. He quit a job that he had been forever, and but they moved. I didn't have to move, thankfully. And uh, to create something that you love and chase a lifestyle that you love and Boy, oh boy, it opened my eyes in the last 11 months what's out there, as long as you're willing to work hard. Can you imagine giving up hunting, right? So it's the pinnacle. It's what we're supposed to be doing anyways, right? So all this stuff, and we talk about sacrifice and all those things, those are all things that are not hunting. Those are all things that can be sacrificed, and we can survive past that. Hunting is the top. It's our compass. It's what we do. It's our everything. It gives us this purpose. It's what we're supposed to be doing anyways. So if it's not directed at hunting, and if, if it's affecting your hunting and your family because those two things are synonymous, get rid of it, right? Get rid of it. Do what you love and make sure that that is following your primal nature and how we are built and what we're supposed to be doing. We dance around this issue all the time. Hunting is at the top because that's how we survived all these years. So all the other stuff is fluff, right? Family and hunting are your directions in life. Everything else, pitch it. Let's go hunt. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, I've I've said I've been on a lot of podcasts where people talk to me. It's like I was on Cody Rich's we entrepreneur podcast. And people always ask me, man, you're hunting a lot. You're this, you know, and when do you decide I get all these, when, well, if I just work 10 more years, I'm going to retire and I'm going to do, no, you're not. You're not. Matt and I had this conversation a little bit yesterday on the mountain, man, I just got to do this. I just got to do that. If I just get over this hill, then I'm on easy street guys. I would rather work in my seventies. Then wait till I'm 60, retire. This is me. This is my personal advice. When I moved to Montana eight years ago, my wife, very similar to Ryan's story, she forced the deal. I'm an entrepreneur. I will not stop. I'm building <laughs> businesses. I'm buying businesses. I'm, I'm creating nightmares for myself, right? And I'm just driven to like my bank account balance. How much money I got? How much money I got? When I get this much, she's like, honey, how much do you need? 
I'm like, I don't know, but we're not there. <laughs> she says, we're done. Our marriage was on the rocks. I mean, it was a whole story. I mean, it was tough, right? She goes, we're done. We're moving in one year. She gave me one year to sell off everything we had, businesses, all of my entanglements. God, if I could have done that 10 years before I did it. Guys, you just got to, I'm not telling you to be reckless. I'm telling you to be purposeful. You're never going to have enough. There's never a number. But, I mean, McDonald's is paying $25 an hour. You can work there until <laughs> you're 80 now. So don't wait. To, don't wait until it's you, your perfect setting or your perfect this. It's never going to be perfect. So, you know, man, I, I really hate seeing those guys that really say, when I'm, man, when, I, when I'm 65, Joel and I just had this conversation. The minute he could get out of the police, he was out. He's ready to throw it out and get it on. And uh, I think that's my biggest advice is don't wait until the time is perfect because it's never going to be perfect. Gary V said uh, one time, would you rather be smiling and laughing in a Toyota Camry or crying in a Porsche? Uh, you know, you could have that job where you're an accountant making all this money, whatever it is, a doctor, you know, Hillary's, you know, uh, but you could have this, you know, Stress eternity of debt. school, tons of debt and this lifestyle, right? Or um, maybe do something with a little less money that you love. Um, and and uh, what's that thing? Like, uh, if you do what you love, then you never work a day in your life, that kind of thing. Look, I just have money's never been a huge driver for me. It's freedom. Freedom is what I want. Money allows me to have a little more freedom. So there's that. But at the end of the day, I just think there's so much more that people are capable of without chasing the almighty dollar, without having a big bank account. Be content with less in that regard and have more time. And that's kind of how I structured my life. When it came time to, to roll the dice, I've rolled the dice. And I've always felt like, you know, what's the worst that could go wrong? Okay, so I fail. I can always go back to what I was doing before. That door almost never closes. It's always there for me. But inevitably, when you make the jump and you commit, you're like, I don't want to go back. Like, I'll find a way. And I think you do. But it takes that jump. We were talking about electrical. He was asking me about, should I buy this business? Should I buy this? And he was... He was looking at, you mind if I say this? He's like, I'm going to buy this business. And if I work there for this long, I can have X. I said, oh, no, 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 no. You buy the business, you get somebody else to run that business. And then you do what you want to do. And I don't know if it moved the needle, but don't buy yourself a job. Don't buy a business or buy a company that you, I always give the, if your personal trainer is the worst job on the planet earth, you only make money when you're training somebody and your reputation is driving it, right? When you're a personal trainer at the gym, you make a hundred dollars an hour. If you're not there, you're not making money. Think about things that you always hear passing. You all, all the buzzwords, right? But you need to create your, you need to wrap your life around things that, that, Keep rolling whether you're there or not. And not not entirely, but where they can function and they can roll when without you. And once you start that, then you'll start picking up another diversification, another. And once you learn how to do it, you just start stacking that all up and you start creating these multiple sources of revenue. That's how I've built my life. And then none of them are huge, but they all add up. And I think a lot of us at this table take that approach. And, um, but that's my advice on that too, is like, it was a great conversation. We're sitting around the fire and, uh, he was like, man, if I just worked there for 10 years, I'll, I'll be set. And I'm like, how about you don't work there and you're still set. <laughs> so thank you everybody thank you. being here.